Thanks very much, Sandy. Yes, I normally would be talking about orchids in a situation like this because that's what I'm really interested in. But um, for the things that I'm interested in doing uh, in terms of genomics, uh, it's Nicotiana because this is many more tools available for it and it's a much more tractable or set of organisms to work with. Um, before I get into this too much today, uh, I just want to acknowledge the other people involved in the project. Um, this is one of those uh, fairly good-sized collaborations, and we've had people at a number of places working on, uh, on this project in its various forms. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is something, to some extent, is based and has come out of what our work has been on Nicotiana and looking forward into something we'd like to do very much and we think now the tools actually exist to be able to do. Um, but uh, so I'll, what I will talk about is a lot of the um, background work was from this consortium of people. Now, before I get started on polyploidy uh, in, a, in a more general sense, I'd just like to remind everybody that the angiosperms, what, what most people talk about when they say plants, the flowering plants or angiosperms are really new kids on the block in an evolutionary sense. They've only been around for the last 150 million years, which sounds like a long time, but in comparison to almost all other groups of organisms, that's a very short period of time. In spite of the short time that they've been around, they came to dominate terrestrial ecosystems in a very quick uh, manner. Darwin talked about the abominable mystery of the origins of the angiosperms, and he was partly talking about the fact that there was no fossil history for them, for quite some time, and then they just appear. And when they appear, they appeared in great diversity. Now, based on molecular phylogenetic studies and molecular clocks, we can now say that that's not an artifact of where they evolved. That is, some people thought maybe they'd been evolving up in the mountains for a long time, uh, and then that's not a good place for fossil deposition. So they didn't show up until they um, got into other habitat types. But we now know, or at least we would, we would support the idea, that they actually did evolve very quickly. They, um, major groups of angiosperms, based on molecular clock studies, the sort of dozen or so major groups, all appeared within about a five million year uh, period, about 140 million years ago, and literally did explode into dominance and into diversity. So the question has always been, <clears throat> excuse me, how did this come about? Well. One of the things that we think is involved in that is polyploidy, although we're not exactly sure how that works out. Um, but polyploidy is a subject that's been uh, debated as to its importance for quite some time. In the early views, such as that's like I show up here from Stebbins, uh, it was that it, it really is an evolutionary dead end because if you have so many copies of genes, there's very inefficient selection on those genes. And so he, said, he really thought that these these never really contributed much to angiosperm evolution. But we know now from these genomic studies that have been completed so far that all angiosperms, in fact, all seed plants have at least one episode of polyploidy in their history, and most groups, such as Abrahabidopsis, have multiple episodes of polyploidy in their evolutionary history. But in spite of the fact that they've had these polyploid uh, episodes, uh, their chromosome numbers don't tend to show that. That is, they're lower than you'd expect for polyploids. So there's always been, again, a bit of a question is, what's, what's really going on here? And uh, why is it that um, polyploidy is relatively common in the angiosperms? And secondly, has that really contributed anything to their evolution? Well, we know that uh, from a, sci a, pub a paper published last year in Science that polyploids have uh, neopolyploids, once they form, have much lower speciation rates than comparable groups of diploids. And importantly, their extinction rates are significantly higher than, than new species that are diploids, that is, don't form with polyploidy in their history. So in spite of the fact that we know that all angiosperms have had these polyploid events, we see these indications that their extinction rates are much higher. So polyploidy is clearly not always a dead end, but most polyploid speciation events do end in extinction for that group. So this is, gives us sort of a difficult uh, set of uh, facts to explain. If polyploidy is making a, a contribution to diversification, then it's not through any subsequent increases in numbers of species. So it's not in the short term. 
it only seems to come into effect in longer term. And um, <clears throat> that is, it, it's something that happens much after the formation of that polyploid group. So it does seem to be a long-term effect. And based on the fact that we know that all angiosperms are polyploids, eventually this is, you know, has, has, has come to uh, be successful. And as I said when I started out, we think it may be one of the factors responsible for the dominance of the angiosperms in terrestrial ecosystems. There was a polyploid event right at the base of uh, the, uh, the angiosperm tree just before the diversification in this five million year period that we think took place. So it could be this is, this is a factor. And so we'd like to understand how polyploidy has contributed to angiosperm evolution. Well, they're going back to the, the question of how many, how many polyploid events are there. Uh, if you were just to go back before these genomic studies and just ask the question of how many angiosperms have polyploidy in their history, the estimates have varied quite considerably between 10 and 60 percent, depending on the author. Well, the reason for this was because there was no consensus as to which numbers, which chromosome numbers were indicative of polyploid ancestry. Some would set the limit at 10 or more. Some would say it had to be 15 or more as pairs of chromosomes. And there was no consensus. And the, and the reason for that is because it's a complete range. It's a continuum. There are no clear breakpoints. So something is masking polyploidy at the whole angiosperm level because we know that numbers of chromosomes in general in angiosperms don't indicate that all angiosperms are polyploid or have polyploidy in their history. Well, polyploidy is most often associated with white hybridization, so they're allopolyploids. And there have been a number of reasons suggested as for why this might result in um, successful uh, speciation, uh, having, and it has things to do with the other things listed up here, but in, in particular, control over levels of expression, because you have more copies of genes, you can express them at, at several more different, several different levels, which a diploid can't do. Uh, and you can also have tissue-specific expression of the parental allele. So one parental set of alleles or allele could be expressed in the leaves, a different one in the roots. And this has been shown in Gossipium by Jonathan Wendell. So there are some advantages, potential advantages, to being a polyploid. But there are also some real problems. And of course, there's this concept of genomic shock, which goes back, back to McClintock. Um, but there are also th such things as no available niche uh, for the hybrid, and they also have to compete with better adapted parents uh, to get to obtain a niche. So there are many reasons why polyploid, newly formed polyploids never make it and, and go extinct. Now, given a successful um, speciation event and, 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 and establishment of a, a, a neopolyploid, a process of diploidization uh, starts to take place. This, uh, this, of course, is well documented. Many parts of this are well documented. And we've been doing quite a bit of this kind of work in Nicotiana because we have several groups of allopolyploids with different ages. Um, so we could look at this process in sort of sequential um, way to see what happened and how soon. Um, gene silencing and deletion is shown by Doug Soltis' work on um, Tragopogon uh, is very quick to start happening. Um, even within a couple generations, it's already well advanced. It's not consistent in those, in those populations, but it is already taking place. Um, genome size reduction takes place. Polyploids, uh, of course, have double the size of their parents um, in terms of genome sizes, in this, and this is uh, quite often um, reduced very quickly. Trait divergence is something that happens once they become moderately successful. They have to form their own ecological niche and develop their own specializations relative to those of their parents. Um, the ribosomal loci, like a lot of the repetitive parts of the genome, are, are going to undergo a lot of changes. And in particular, the ribosomal genes go back down to diploid numbers quite quickly after formation of a polyploid. And then some people wouldn't include this last one, but I do. Um, that chromosome fusions and condensations take place. And this is really the focus of what I'd like to talk about in the rest of the uh, talk today. Um, but you need to talk about, I can't talk about this globally because it's too complicated. So I'm going to talk about just what's happened in Nicotiana. So it gives you some sense of the um, evolutionary context in which this uh, chromosomal reorganization takes place. So 
Sandy already talked about Solanaceae this morning, so I won't say too much more about that. Nicotiana is about 70 species, most of which, or majority of which, are found in the Neotropics, South America, and a disjunct group in North America. And there's one section, which is an aloe polyploid section, that is found in Australasia and one of those species in Africa. This is a very recent event. It's only happened about 10 million years ago, so this is not a, a result of plate tectonics. This is a long distance dispersal from the parentals in South America to the polyploid derivatives in Australia and the one species in Africa. And we'll come back to those, that group, in just a minute. Just to show you what Nicotianas look like, they're not all, they don't all look like Nicotiana tobacco. Um, there's quite a bit of floral diversity and pollinator relationships. Unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about that today, but there's some nice looking horticultural subjects there as well as some commercial products from uh, Nicotiana. Now, the background for this understanding the evolutionary history of these allotetraploid groups is shown with this low copy nuclear gene here, just showing you the um, section of uh, Suavialentes has two copy types from its parents, a Sylvestris sequence and an obtusifolia type sequence. Um, these are about 10 million years old, so they've diverged fairly strongly from the parental sequence. So the Sylvestris type sequence is there, but Sylvestris is down there, and you can see there's quite a bit of sequence divergence in this low copy nuclear gene, so on and so forth. So we have all this kind of information. We've also been doing GISH. We've been looking at the process of diploidization, chromosome, um, um, ribosomal, chrom uh, ribosomal gene number, and all these kinds of things. And just to show you a little bit, this is tobacco, which is a very recently formed allo allotetraploid. Here, uh, using GISH, which works very well, you can see that there are intergenomic translocations between the two, um, the S and the T genome. The ribosomal genes are not shown here, but the ribosomal genes are, are, are exactly what you'd predict from knowing what its parental, parental numbers and, and locations are, so it's perfectly additive. The flowers are, and the habit are morphologically intermediate. Ecologically, we can't say too much about this species because uh, it's only known to be associated with human habitation in South America where it's native. It doesn't have a natural ecology. It could be as little as a few thousand years old. We really don't know how young it is, but it is a recently formed allotetraploid and might have, the, the, the Native Americans might have had a hand in at least rescuing it and putting, bringing it into cultivation. So this is a recently formed um, allotetraploid and it's perfectly additive for its parent traits and morphologically intermediate. Now this section, Rapandi, is another allotetraploid group, the two parents above four species produced here. This, this group we estimate to be about five million years old. Um, and if you do gish on it, you don't get much of a result. Um, there's the few, a few things light up, um, or you get some weak uh, signals across all of the chromosomes, but GISH no longer works. So the intergenomic homogenization that's, take, that's taken place in that five million years has made GISH ineffective. GISH is based on the repetitive com components of the genome, and these have diverged enough that the parental um, DNA is no longer hybridized to the, to the progeny. And if you look at ribosomal loci, which are not shown here, these are now diploid in number, so they've lost the extra copies. These are physically deleted. And then morphologically speaking, there are the two parents and the four progeny, and those are the flower morphologies are no longer, are not intermediate, which they would have been to start with. Three of them have gone over to the same moth pollination syndrome as Sylvestris, and Nudicollis, the fourth, uh, has, is a uh, bee-pollinated species like the other parent, Obtusifolia. So you can see here that diploidization, successful establishment of this group of plants has led to their divergence from the parents, both genomically and, and morphologically, and we, in these cases also ecologically. These have become specialized in their own ways. So this is after five million years. This, you can see that there is some evolutionary dynamic developing in this group of species. There are four of them that originated from a single uh, original cross, so there is some diversification at the species level, um, but of course this produced four, four species after five million years isn't a very high rate of diversification compared to what's been demonstrated in some diploid groups. Now I'd like to move on to the 
sort of the main point here is getting into what's going on with this group that's found in Australia and the Pacific Islands and the one species in Africa. This formed about 10 million years ago, and now there are 26 species in this group. So this is a group that very recently, um, based on the fact that these are very little genetically diverged, um, has undergone a diversification. So 10 million years after their formation, we're beginning to see um, the, the result of polyploidy. It took 10 million years for them to really start speciating on their own, in their own right. Uh, and this is, I think, goes to substantiate this idea that polyploidy doesn't confer any instant advantages. It's a great deal of disadvantage, results in extinction at a high rate, and it's only after quite a period of time before the advantages of being a polyploid actually come into, into play. And that's after substantial diploidization that's taken place with a lot of the results of, of polyploidy being removed from the genomes of these plants. Now this is a map of Australia with a few of the species just plotted on here to show you their distributions. And the point that I would like to make here is that in this group, ancestrally, these would have had 24 pairs of chromosomes. Some of the species now are down to as low as n equals 15, so 15 pairs of chromosomes. Uh, and what you can see here is the diversity of numbers. But if you can make sense of what's shown up here, what you can see is those with higher numbers are around the north and down the east, which are the sort of moderate parts of the Australian uh, continent. And as they moved into the interior of the continent, chromosome number is reduced, is, is going down until you hit a place like Ayers Rock, which has seven species. So the greatest diverse species diversity in this group is in the driest parts of Australia. It, in the phylogenetic tree of these species, those with the, the high numbers, n equals 24, n equals 23, are attached to the base of the uh, phylogenetic tree, and these ones with lower numbers are out in the, out in the tips. So these are undergoing um, chromosome reduction. Genome size is not vary, varying amongst these species. They're all the same regardless of whether they're n equals 24 or n equals 15. So this is not what's behind this reduction. Uh, this genome size is, is more or less constant. Well, what goes on when you have these chromosome reductions? We know quite a bit about what goes on in groups like the crucifers where uh, they've been using um, back uh, libraries to do chromosome uh, labeling studies, and they can show, for example, that those three chromosomes in uh, this ancestral crucifer um, end up uh, in uh, Coringia being condensed into two chromosomes. So I like to call this, you could call it chromosome reduction, but it, it really is a, a fusion, a reorganization that's taking place, and uh, it's probably more appropriately called chromosome condensation. So those three, cro three chromosomes end up being um, made into two, and it's quite a complex series. It's not just a simple putting the bits there. They're, they're being uh, shoveled around quite substantially. Are there any ideas for why these sort of things happen? Why does chromosome condensation happen? Why does reorganization happen? Well, you actually have to go back quite a ways in the literature to find the some hypotheses for what's going on. Uh, Darlington from the 1930s and then later Stebbins in the 50s both talked about this quite a bit. Everybody knows that, that higher numbers produce a more variable progeny because you can have independent assortment of traits. So this is a strategy favored in long-lived species, trees, perennials, and it's associated with outbreeding. Lower numbers fix allelic combinations, uh, and this is a short-term strategy favored in annuals and, and short-lived herbs. It's often associated also with inbreeding. So the hypothesis here, if what's going on, is that at the time these condensations are taking place, is that um, genes that are under selection are important for the survival of these species are being shuffled and ended up being made into linkage groups in those with lower numbers, those species with lower numbers. So this, again, would suggest that this is somehow driven by selection. It's not random. Um, we would propose or assume that in the populations in which these are taking place that there are variable chromosome arrangements and those that are selected for are the ones where linkage groups are forming because these are able to deliver favorable allelic combinations intact to their progeny. And this would be an evolutionary advantage. 
So what we'd be hypothesizing is going on here in Nicotiana is exactly that sort of process. The genes that are under strong selection are being condensed uh, onto the same chromosomes, forming linkage groups in those that are with lower number. Now these, of course, started out as any, the diploid parents of these were n equals 12. So in those that are down to n equals 15, uh, those are already getting pretty, pretty close back down to the parental chromosome numbers. And this is just a good e illustration of why it has always been difficult to say how many species of angiosperms were polyploid because these numbers don't stay up. They go down, uh, they're condensed, and uh, this makes it impossible to determine what's a polyploid and what's not, just based purely on chromosome number. Of course, all of these we know are, are allotetraploids, uh, and this, is, this sort of condensation now is taking place within the last million years or so of their 10 million year uh, history since their formation. So there, are, could, there could be intrinsic reasons for why this process is taking place, just something to do with genome organization, genome functioning, that would favor these reductions. However, it's interesting to see that these kinds of um, reduction series uh, of chromosome numbers take place in groups where you'd predict fit into the scenario that Stebbins and Darlington first set up, in groups that are dealing with harsh conditions, environmental conditions, annuals, these are, these are rapid cyclers. These species of Nicotiana germinate, flower, and then disappear in a very short period of time, and they respond to rain and the availability of rain in these dry habitats. Uh, and so they, they, uh, they, become very, um, they become very specialized in, in these rapid life history strategies. Uh, and so this would be exactly the kind of situation where selection would favor uh, linkage groups of, these, of the genes that are important for their survival. So here we've got a situation where we could predict what's going on in, the, in this group of, of uh, tobacco. Uh, and uh, we should be able to come up with some ways of testing it. However, prior to next generation methods, I couldn't come up with any reasonable way of testing these things. But now I think we have possibilities of actually being able to, to test some of these hypotheses. So given that um, I don't have much more time and I'm just talking about things that I would like to do and not things that I have done yet, um, we'd, like, we'd like to um, look at chromosome rearrangements. There's, a, of course, uh, tomato is, is sequenced. There's a back library of chromosomes, and these we know we can hybridize to, um, to, the, to these Nicotianas. They do hybridize reasonably well. So we should be able to look at the physical rearrangements of the chromosomes, uh, and there are some gene uh, mapping that's been done um, in uh, Nicotiana relative to tobacco, so we have some idea about the order of genes and, and uh, syntony uh, in tobacco relative to, to, to tomato. And then, of course, what we'd really like to be able to do is sequence six or eight or so complete Nicotiana genomes. Uh, one has already been sequenced. Nicotiana benthamiana is sequenced, although it's not assembled or annotated or anything yet. It's just in shreds. Um, but we're hoping by the time we get around to wanting to do uh, work with that, that it'll be in better shape. But given that we could have one fairly well um, uh, um, sequenced and, and assembled, then we would use that to assemble the others relative to that. We'd also use next generation methods to identify SNPs so that we could uh, scan for genes that are not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, that is, those that are under strong selection. We'd also be looking for the signature of higher non-synonymous uh, numbers of substitutions that are indicative of directional selection. So we will use next generation methods to identify genes that are potentially um, under strong selection uh, so that we can see then where they're located and know what's happening in these genomes as they're being condensed. And we'd also use some other approaches to, to look at di uh, differential expression. So again, using multiple methods to get at each of the issues here so that we could um, begin to um, sort out whether in fact uh, in these species with lower chromosome numbers, the genes that are under selection are now in linkage. Of course, we could ask questions about other species. Um, there is lots of evidence from other species that speciation genes are in tight linkage groups. This has been shown in Drosophila, zebra finches, grasshoppers, Heliconius butterflies, so lots of animals. These are speciation genes, not just genes that are under strong selection. 
But nobody, although they find, think it's very interesting to find that these are in tight leakage groups, nobody has asked how they get there, which I think is interesting. Um, and why is it, that, why is it they, um, this is possible? How does it come about? So it does look like in other groups of organisms, uh, these this kinds of processes are, are in operation. Uh, and it, it's interesting that amongst plants, angiosperms are, are really the only ones that have gone in for polyploidy in, in a major way. Um, but in spite of the involvement of polyploidy and multiple episodes of polyploidy in angiosperm evolutionary history, lower numbers predominate. Now this, I think, says something about what angiosperms are doing uh, over a longer evolutionary time scale. And I think this is um, potentially indicative that there are episodes in which they're, they're herbaceous and short-lived, and it's during these times that chromosome numbers come back down, and then trees re-evolve from these kinds of uh, species. So that, that implies something that we haven't any, ev any evidence for just yet, but I think we're approaching a time when we can start to get at some of these things. Now, what does this say about angiosperm genomes and their organization? Well, I don't know yet, but I suspect this is important. And people, when they're working on genomics of angiosperm, angiosperms, should keep this in mind, because I think this is potentially something that is unique to the angiosperms and has been used in their evolutionary history uh, in, a, in a way that has resulted in this explosive radiation that we've seen and their dominance in a relatively short evolutionary time span. So um, I'm really pleased that these next generation methods are out there because it gives people that are interested, like myself, in the evolution of these kinds of groups and what's going on with chromosomes and chromosome number, uh, some tools that we can use for the first time to, to be able to address these kinds of questions. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Uh, Richard Summers from RGT Seeds. My background is as a wheat breeder, so I'm used to thinking about a, a, a hexaploid cultivated species. So um, what I'm interested to try and understand, so we're forming these allotetraploids, and I tend to view that from a wheat perspective of having homey alleles across my three genomes. So I can understand you might have that when you go from 12 to 24, you've then got effectively two homey alleles. When these condense, you're losing some of that uh, homeallelism, you'll keep some. Will the homeallelos you keep, do you think they maintain the same gene function between the two genomes, or do they evolve to have new gene function? Well, at least the cases we, we know, uh, at least I'm familiar with, um, don't look as though uh, neo-functionalization is such a big issue. Um, looking at the, um, these sorts of uh, allotetraploids, we don't see a great deal of evidence for, for new functions for these divergent uh, loci, for the duplicated loci, excuse me. Uh, Graham Moore of the John Ennis Center. Um, I was going to ask, so when you, when you fuse a chromosome, basically what you're doing is reducing the combination in the segment which has gone into the centromere. So that's basically what you could, am I getting, is that's basically what you're arguing, that you've actually lost recombination and therefore you'll lose the, diver the uh, diversity which will happen in that segment. That's right. That's the idea. So in cereals, for example, when we did the synteny story, essentially the, the chromosomes, when we found that they reduced, and they went in uh, as centric fusions. So that's how they, that's how they evolved. It'd be interesting to see with Yeah, so see if that's what's happening with these things, yeah. yeah. Uh, Rena Al-Mohar, University of Birmingham. My question is about applied uh, status. It affects gene expression. So do you think that the ploid status, uh, it, uh, it has a relation or a direct interaction with the chromatin organization? If the ploid status has a direct interaction or effect on the organization of the chromatin? I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I understand the question. So if it's, it affects the condensation status of the chromosome, yeah? Well, it, it doesn't in the short term, no. But in the longer term, it probably would. So I want to know just if the gene expression is affected or the morphology. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Gene, gene, gene expression is very highly affected in a newly formed polyploid. That's, that's been demonstrated that the controls, the ep epigenetic controls are, are completely thrown out in these newly formed polyploids. And um, there's wild, wildly variable levels of expression. 
So it might be a spatial rearrangement of the chromatin, and so allowing some genes to be expressed or to be silenced at a certain uh, moment. Yes, I, I'm not so sure what the mechanism for silencing is, but there, it's, it's known that it, that happens very quickly too. Okay, thank you.